with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you and just with our hearts lifted up of the fact that you are our Savior, our Redeemer, and you keep your word. You keep your word to Israel. If we will read your word, believe your word, and live within the precepts of that word, what a wonderful life we will have, meaning we will have a higher difference than what the world has experienced today on many, many levels. But we have to learn to obey your word, to obey your authority. And that's the uh, objective of all these messages, to turn our hearts to you, our true Savior and Redeemer. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to entitle this message, The Lord is My Shepherd. I don't know about you, but that just encourages me in many ways and, and uh, gives me uh, a spark of spiritual uh, Holy Spirit-led uh, inspiration. I don't know about you, but I don't often, as often as I should anyway, think about the Lord as my shepherd. We're going to get into that as we move on here, especially with regard to the 23rd Psalm of David. We just finished a 20-part series on the whole armor of God, uh, which we shared various aspects, for instance, on deliverance. And I hope that a number of you will uh, review those, listen to them, because I, get, I believe you will gain greater spiritual inspiration in listening to that particular series especially the part on the deliverance from our enemies. I shared several messages on various aspects of how God will and can deliver us from our enemies. White Adamic Israelite people. We need to wake up to the fact that we do, as I said in a number of, of uh, or parts of that various series, that we do have an enemy, that our race and our people are under attack today. And just think about the various ways, dear Christian brethren, that we are under attack today. It's not hard to uh, come to a... a number of conclusions on that particular question that I'm asking you there today. All of you can readily see, I'm sure, that we are economically under attack, politically, educationally, internationally even, religiously, and socially under attack. The question is why? Well, the answer We've heard over and over, not from me, per se, but from the Word of God. Over and over, God reiterates the fact that His people, His covenant people, are in trouble today on lots of various levels, in lots of different ways, because we are defying His Word. That's a strong word to use, defy. Can you imagine children, what happens when they defy the, their father and mother? What happens in the home? Uh, harmony breaks down real quick. There's strife, there's division, there are all kinds of problems because we or children defy their parents. God says, hey, obey your parents. Same thing he says over and over to his children, the children of Israel, obey me, do not defy me. 
And we learn from his word that the more God's people defy him, the more wicked they will become. Hmm. The more wicked they will become, meaning they will literally become as the wicked. And we see that in our world today in lots of different ways. That for not only cities we can think of, but they're, practically every city is getting more and more like Sodom and Gomorrah. But the people are themselves, our people are becoming more like the wicked. They are becoming more like Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're walking in the ways of Sodom and Gomorrah, just like our people are walking in the ways of Babylon today. Are they not? In lots of different ways. Now, as we become more and more like the wicked, our people meaning... They are going to do certain things. And one of the most important things for us to understand is that the more wicked we become, the more we will covet the ways of our enemies. Now that is a sad fact, and that is a sad reality of what we are experiencing today, my dear friends. We start listening to our enemies, the more wicked we become, do we not? We start believing their lies. And we, we walk in the ways of deception because we're listening to the enemy more than we're listening to God. Again, meaning our people. And we can see this throughout our nation and throughout wherever they're scattered. And wherever they brought in the enemy and allowed the enemy within their gate, we go down, we become the tail. We do not become the head, like on the example of the dog, right? So for many, uh, uh, in many ways, we can see a bunch of tails out there, as I tell people, T-E-L-L, -L, not T-A-I-L there. Right? We are, we're seeing them as tails. Now, I don't want to get too graphic, but, you know, you think about a dog and you think about his tails, and with a, a lot of animals, they're to keep the flies off. <laughs> because, um, well, you figure it out. We're hardly even doing that today. We're not even keeping the flies off. We're acting, let me use another word, like a bunch of rear ends today. And that's what God's Word says pretty much about what would happen to us today. And yet, how stupid are, is our, has our race become? Of course, the more we defy God's Word, don't read His Word, don't obey His Word, we become like that. But how we are somehow, our people have become comfortable, if I may use that word, in being as the wicked. We are literally dying today as a people and as a nation because of this wicked status we have embraced. And we willingly open the floodgate in our nation to allow the aliens into our country because, well, we've become more corrupt in our thinking. Our people, again, have become more corrupt in their thinking. But why and how have they become more corrupt in their thinking? Because they're listening more to the enemy they're not reading God's word. They're not obeying God's word. And the enemy keeps telling them, hey, do we, the way to be blessed, Israel, is to, again, open the floodgate. Now, when you're opening the floodgate, 
you're doing a number of different things. Are you not Israel? You're allowing the enemy or the pagans people into your country for the most part. It used to be we would allow mostly our own Adamic, I'll say Aryan even, white Israelite people into our nation, even though uh, there, there would be questions on how a Christian they would be. But still, we, we can allow uh, our own brethren into the nation, our nation, under certain conditions. I won't get into that right now. But when we're allowing today, what's happening in our nation is by allowing the alien into our nation today, well, pretty much we're allowing the third world dark nations into our world. Now, I've gone over this a number of times, but we, we want to kind of slowly go over this a little bit with you here. And we want to think about what's happening when we're doing that. Because this is blasphemy, what we have been doing. This, how many know, obviously, rhetorical question, how serious God takes blasphemy? I mean, it's a death penalty. We are not to blaspheme God Almighty. And when we're denying His law and His law of word, in many ways, we're, we're allowing this uh, blasphemy against God to come into the nation, and it's going to only further corrupt us and bring us down. But when we're allowing these third world dark nations into our country, we're allowing them to bring their temples and their shrines and their groves and their practices and their religion again, which is pagan, allowing them to come in and allowing them to eat of the fruits of our labor. Now, where did the fruits of our labor come from? How did, God, how did America become such a blessed nation for the first 200 years here, let's say? How? Because we're um, white? Well, to a certain degree, God's blessed our race, no doubt about it. He's given us ingenuity, and, and uh, he has blessed our nation. But we are really not blessed, and we cannot advance. We have white people in our nation nation today. But now I realize God, the, the dark races are here and we become paganized and everything. But we really need the Spirit of God to dwell here. But we're not, shall I say, making the Spirit of God feel very comfortable here. Can we ever, can, is, it a, is it possible biblically for God's Holy Spirit to feel comfortable and to dwell here when we are denying His law? We're, de we're denying his covenant when we're allowing idols and idolatry and people who hate him, who will not serve him, who will not obey him to come into our nation just on the surface level. We're allowing them and encouraging these other races to come into our nation and assimilate when they are not coming in here to assimilate at all. They're coming here to invade our nation, as I've gone over with you before. And it's not just a physical invasion. It's a spiritual invasion of sorts. And what are they bringing with them when they're coming here? They're bringing in their politics. I'm going to go a little bit further. They're bringing in their ignorance into this nation. You go into these third world countries, and um, folks, it's pretty animalistic the way that they are living, the way that they are behaving. They are doing so for the thousands and thousands of years. Living in paganism, living in filthy conditions. Am I right or am I right? And, you, and, and bringing 
them. They're going to bring their culture. Bringing their culture, bringing their ways into this nation, what's it going to do to America? Is it going to bless America, or shall we say curse America? Well, obviously it's cursing our nation. Not only are they bringing their corruption into this nation, but also go further and say they're bringing their disease into this nation. Yes, bringing these third world people into our nation in a major way is contributing to a lot of diseases that we have today. Now I know we got the Frankenstein food and we got the corruption of our, our uh, of our food in a lot of different ways and the sprays and the poisons and the fluoride and, and all the different things that are going on today. Yeah, that's also a, that's a part of it. But they're also, when they're coming into our nation, they are bringing their diseases with them. And we're suffering as a people because of this and all the various other things that I've been talking about concerning bringing the aliens into our nation. But why and how is this possible? It's because we have become, our people have become more wicked because they're defying God Almighty and they're defying His Word and His laws. What's another way of looking at this, a way of thinking about this way? In other words, defying God's law is committing national suicide. We've been committing national suicide for well over 100 years in our nation. The more suffering and national curses, that are happening today, we are seeing right before our very eyes. In a way, you can almost transport yourself back to the time of Israel in the land of Egypt in their captivity there and witnessing all the diseases, all the problems and the things that were going on back then or in a way going on today. All the things that were going on when uh, it, uh, the Israelites came out of Egypt and God brought them into the, quote, promised land. And they all of a sudden wanted to be like the other nations. Well, don't you see that today? What's the cry? What's this new world orderism about? What's globalism all about today? It's what we want to be like the other nations. Oh, do you really? I would like to extend to them an open invitation to leave our nation and go. I wonder if that's biblical. Hmm. Would we want even our white uh, Anglo-Saxon people who are living in defiance against God to leave our nation? Well, isn't that what happened when Moses came down from the mountain? He says, those are on the Lord's side. Come over here and serve him. Those of you who don't, you want to go be like the other nations. You want to live in idolatry. You want to adopt their ways. You go live over there, and let's see what happens. And all of a sudden, there's a big earthquake, and God destroyed them. Right? I mean, there's, we've got to look at the answer that is provided from us from God's Word. We've got to ask questions again. We've got to look at the biblical reality that is put forth to us, not in the world, but in the Word of God, and gain biblical understanding about what His purposes are for us. Your job and my job is to get in proper alignment with God Almighty and His purposes. That's, that's the whole duty. Serve the Lord, put Him first, seek His kingdom. That's what our main objective in life is really all about. That's why we're here, folks. And until we understand that and we get in line with God Almighty properly, get in alignment with His Word, start reading His Word, start applying His Word, start teaching His Word, start shining forth His light and the Holy Spirit, uh, well, the Holy Spirit's not going to grow if you're not going to read and, and abide in His Word. 
But I just want to say all that because I want the point to be made that America needs deliverance. Who are the Adamic people? Well, um, in part, they're, they're of our race, but biblically, uh, the word Adam means to blush and show red in the face. And we teach in this ministry that only the white Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people have that biblical characteristic of which we can blush and show red in the face. And it is unto them, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in which God Almighty made a covenant with them. I'm going over biblical history with you in short order, but there is this covenant relationship that God Almighty established with His people. And we are to honor that relationship. We are to come into the bonds of that covenant again, that covenantal understanding that is put forth to us in His Word. And we need to realize our proper biblical place. What is that? To understand that we have a great shepherd. Yes. And his, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what the scriptures tell us. And so God's people need to, therefore, come out of this world and into the hands of their loving shepherd, our loving shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, come into his kingdom to seek his kingdom, not the things of this world, but the things of God. Now, I'm being some repetitious in many ways for us this morning because it's through this biblical repetition, this biblical teaching that we come to light, truth, and understanding. See, we don't need a volumes and volumes of psychology today. We need just the Word of God to apply it, to read it, and believe it. Um, the world hates God's Word because this Word goes contrary to what the world is doing. It goes contrary to... Uh, all the systems and structures and politics and government, you name it, of man that is presented in the world that we have today. What will the ways of man lead to? Well, it'll lead to Babylon, yeah. And we're in a state of Babylon today and most people would have no problem with living in Babylon. They, they, they would really rather live in that environment. I don't know how many times I've heard over the years, for instance, New York City, which some people call Jew York City. But anyway, because the Jews do love New York City. They love Wall Street. They love what New York is all about. They love the control that the media has there. That's their, uh, that's their empire. But so many times over the years, and maybe you guys can relate to this, but I've heard the people in New York say, I love New York. I would not want to be anywhere else but in New York City. Well, I've been there a number of times, and, you know, it's, uh, it's like, uh, I'll, I'll compare it to going looking at the pyramids. It's very impressive at first. You look at it and you see all these huge, it's a concrete jungle is what I call it. And it's big. They call it the Big Apple. It's big. I mean, they're because they have um, these huge buildings all over the place. Empire, uh, uh, the uh, Empire State Building was there. I like the fact that Trump mentioned that effect. It took one year to build it. 
Today, under all the regulations, it would take more than 10 years even to get the paperwork finished on the place. But, I mean, there were, there, there are some marvelous accomplishments um, really of man and, and of man's power of the purse or wealth, quote, wealth, not God's wealth, in which our hearts of the people are enlarged by what they see and what they would experience in New York City. And it's pushed all the time on TV. The ways of New York are pushed all the time on TV. They think of themselves, really a lot of New Yorkers think of themselves so much smarter. They're not like the Bible Belt area, fly over America. That, that's, that's the Bible Belt area. Those are the backwoods people. We are the enlightened ones in New York. It's, it's pretty much along those lines in which I've heard about it. And it's so sad. The last place, and if some of you are unhappy with New York and want to live there, God bless you, go do it. But after a day or so, not even that, I couldn't wait to get the heck out of New York. For a lot of various reasons. The things that I saw, the things that I experienced there were just, they turned my stomach. When I was in San Francisco, the same thing happened. It turned my stomach. And if some of you have been to San Francisco and only driven through there when there's a traffic jam, you haven't really experienced San Francisco as an example. You need to go downtown, park your car, and walk through the streets of downtown San Francisco and tell me how you feel. Tell me what you see, what you're going to experience. It won't be good. L.A., same thing. In fact, pretty much it's, it's gotten to the fact that if you go along the coastal areas of the United States of America, go all the way down from Boston, down to Florida, Miami, go along over the uh, California coast and go up the California coast, go into Portland, Oregon, go into Seattle, Washington, tell me what you're going to see and what you're going to experience in those areas Do you feel God's calling in those areas? Do you feel the word of God exalted, light of God's word and God's purposes and God's people coming together? Do you see? Well, you don't. You don't see any of those things, not even close to it. Because those are evidences, those people have become evidence of what will happen when God's people turn from his word. And by the way, I don't want to leave out Texas. It's one of those, on those coastal areas. Texas, I, I tell you, what, it was not a bad place. Just like back in the 50s, L.A. used to be, I've heard, a pretty good place. But not anymore. Oh, okay. Well, I'm on my soap opera box here. I want to talk about South Africa. I saw a thing. How many of you saw I sent you out a thing on South Africa this morning about what is happening in South Africa? It was like in the 1600s, the Boers moved there, and they transformed that place through hard work into um, a nice, wonderful um area. And for pretty much over 200 years, they had it to themselves. The blacks weren't there. Very, very few of them cared about that area, were in that area. But in about 200 years after they landed there, they started um, 
uh, in tribal ways migrating there because they were pushed to do that, first of all. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident that uh, the way a lot of things are happening in this transformation of America is not an accident. Agenda 21 is not an accident, for instance. It's all planned and purposed and programmed. Communism is not an accident. Someone plotted against Christianity. I love that book by Elizabeth Dilling, The Plotters Against Christianity. They've been plotting against Christianity. They've been many, many steps ahead of most Christians. Well, you know, we really don't have to worry about what they're doing so much as we need to concern ourselves with our duty to God Almighty and please Him and put Him first. But uh, it's sad what's happened. And I, the um, one of them I was listening to recently on in South Africa showed the brutality of the dark race. They would stick canes through the, their body of these Boer people and farmers and brutally murder these people and still are doing that today. And they would actually drink their blood and eat their organs. But how many times have the, has the media, any time our media, any of it, expose what the reality and the horrors and the assault and the murder and the mayhem of what's really going on in South Africa and the attack of our white brethren over there. You go over there, it's worse than Chicago. Bars, people are putting over their houses, having to pay for extra security. There's the uh, private security service, they were saying, way out numbers by the hundreds of thousands, the police force, and it's a very corrupt police force that exists there. But there, these are fortresses almost that people are having to establish there to protect themselves, to feel safe at night, and many of them have guns under their pillows because they don't know and they're in fear that the uh, blacks, the dark race, would break into their house and guess what they would do to them? They wouldn't just murder them by uh, uh, most means that most of you would think about. They would leave a message. They would brutally murder the people in South Africa and still are doing it. And a lot of this is not being told. Why and how could that happen? Well, we could ask why and how could it happen? What's happening in Chicago? How could it become so brutal? How could it become so... Uh, place where our nation, our people would tolerate that brutality. Well, how could we tolerate it in anywhere, in all the riots and all the things that are going on today? How can we get to the point where we would tolerate it? Because we become as the wicked. We need a Savior. We need to follow our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, which means we need to follow his word. So I'd have you turn in your Bibles to the 23rd Psalm. Verse 1. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let me just say real quick that if the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Want in, in anything you can imagine. You may think that's um, hyperbole, just throwing things out, just for the sake of making it sound good. I believe what God's word, this one statement, this one verse says here, totally. But you... We have to do what? We have to have him 
and accept him and believe him as our shepherd. We have to depend upon him, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, as our great shepherd. And he is the Word. In the beginning was Word. The Word was God. The Word, this Word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's what that verse basically is telling us. All right, verse 2 here. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, the shepherd. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul and leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Abiding in his word. Yea, the way walk through the valley of the shadow of the death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Now, this oil is a type of the what? Holy Spirit. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a powerful Bible uh, chapter here from the uh, Psalms. And I love this last verse. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do these verses not speak to your heart, brethren? Do you not want to? And our people are crying out all over, wherever they are, that they would love to dwell in the house, would they not? They, they, they're, we're getting to the point for many of our brethren, they, they really are coming to the point where they're calling upon the Lord. They want to dwell in the house of the Lord. They want his salvation, biblical salvation. Jesus died upon the cross, we are told, to redeem his people, to restore us. And that's in the restoration, as I said in the last message, the purpose of that is to bring us into the kingdom and give us a greater kingdom understanding. It is, it is to be our goal and our objective covenant Israelite people. But clearly, we do not live today, as I went over earlier, in a righteous world. We live in a world that is corrupt, that's pagan. Yes, full of hate and degradation. It's become animalistic in so many ways, perverted and evil. And God's Word tells us to stay out of this world. And so, for those of you who are here even, and those of you who are watching on DVD, I pray that you're not trying to make yourself comfortable in this world. And I would question you. Think about it. Are you comfortable in this world? Are you happy with this world? Are you Look at all the craziness again that's going on. It's all over. The insanity. It keeps growing and growing and growing. It's like the big balloon. You feel it, and it keeps expanding, right? And it keeps expanding, and it keeps expanding, depending on the size of your balloon, and it keeps growing and growing. Until at some point, it's going to pop or explode. It's a big bang theory. That's the real big bang theory right there, if you want to know what it is. But is the truth, is this yearning for truth that will set us free in your heart? 
See, this is, now we're getting on what true biblical salvation is all about. And Christ is in your heart. And I always like to ask, in what way? What do you mean by Christ is in your heart? Are you obeying his word? Are you living as though he is your king? Are you seeking his kingdom? Do you have that covenant understanding within your heart and mind? Or are you pursuing, again, things of the kingdom? Which brings me to ask this question to all of you out there. What's your home like? Let me repeat that question. What's your home like? Is your home a Christian home? A Christian environment where your family can come out of worldly corruption? Is your home a Christ-honoring home and environment? Would world police, let's use that as an example, would world police, if they searched your home, find evidence that you serve Christ, that you read the Bible, that you're different from the world, that your family reflects biblical values, that the Lord is your shepherd? Again, 23rd Psalm in verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This first verse from the 23rd Psalm is, I think, much more spiritually enlightening, enlightening our minds and our hearts and we need to give it a little bit more time than I think what a lot of people are doing. Again, truly, Jesus is to be our great shepherd. He is, as the Bible says over and over in many cases, and we're going to get into this right now, he's the great shepherd of who? Israel. Well, how many in the world that, or Judeo-Christianity, if you ask them that, would tell you he's a great shepherd of Israel? That's the answer they would give you. Or would they give you some other answer? The world, you said. Is that true? Is Jesus the Savior of the world? I would have you turn to, first of all, uh, Psalm chapter 80. Let's start reading in verse 1. Psalm 80, verse 1. I love these, and we'll read verse 2. I love these two verses. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Who's Joseph? Who's he talking about here? Uh, Israel. Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. You know what this shine forth is? a type of really the Shekinah glory and the Holy Spirit. It's a type of the Holy Spirit. You want the Holy Spirit to come, Israel? Come forth in your hearts. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. There's where your salvation is, Israel. It's unto Israel. Come and save us. Here's what Jesus said also from John chapter 10 and verse 11. He said, quote, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Meaning the house of Israel. Israel. Jesus is not the shepherd of the world. Find that for me in the scriptures in context. It's not there. At the best you could do is 
call on one verse, which is they, what they quote, the Judeo-Christians quote is John 3.16. But in context, that's not the world. In fact, that premise is contradictory to all the other warnings that Jesus gave us about the world. He's telling Israel he was in uh, the land, quote, of Israel back then under the old covenant, speaking to his people. He was not, quote, in China. He was not in, like I like to say, uh, dark Africa. He was not in North Korea. And people may think, well, hmm. I have some things uh, I would like to add on that, but you know, pretty much, folks, the third world countries are still third world dark countries, and it is only as the white man has come in and brought aspects of his culture, even his religion, is there somewhat of a light coming forth from there. And we need to truly look at that again and examine that again to understand what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What, what is really going on there? If you take God's people out of a situation, let's look at South Africa. If you take God's people, the Boers, out of South Africa, what will happen to South Africa? Can I all open it? What? Yeah, just like what happened in Rhodesia. Anywhere else in the world that you can think of. If you remove us, it becomes darker. It becomes more pagan. Why is that? We have perverted the Israel, Abrahamic covenant so much, folks. There is so such a gross misunderstanding of God's covenant and purpose among his people. And we have misused and abused that really kingdom message. And we're not addressing the proper biblical kingdom message today. We've got to get back to the proper biblical kingdom message and have that understanding, or we're not going to get the right results. But again, even though I have not fully developed this, I'm going to say again, Jesus is not the shepherd of the world. He's the shepherd of of Israel. That's what the scriptures tell us over and over and over. There's another word I want to use right now. He's the keeper, the keeper of his house. Jesus is the keeper of, therefore, we would, could say easily, he's the keeper of the house of Israel. Jesus said, I have not come but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, you, the um, think about the old West and cowboys corralling the cattle into the this corral, right? So I want to use that as an example and say Jesus is not corralling all the various races in the world into some multiracial house. He's not doing that. And that's the type of, may I say again, Judeo-Christian gospel that is taught ad nauseum over and over and over again. That's the house of worship that they would want everybody to come into and believe and worship God in that type of a lie and deception. 
It's a Judeo-Christian Talmudized deception. And it's no small matter. It's a major point of deception. And we've got to understand it. We've got to come out of it. You can't come out of something if you do not understand that it is a deception, that it is a lie, that it is a falsehood. And we've got to quit. Our people have got to quit eating on that lie, believing that lie. A true shepherd does not corrupt or mix his sheep, does he? Guess who will? False shepherds will do that. Verse 14. John 10, verse 14. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. Doesn't know the world. I know my sheep and am known of mine. Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, so even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep of Israel. And other sheep I have, which were not of this fold. Oh, wow, I don't know. I mean, maybe you missed it, Pastor. Other sheep have I, there are not this. This means the world, the Gentiles, the world out there, anybody. Red and yellow, black and white. Is that what this means? Is that what this verse is saying? Absolutely, it's a lost sheep. He says, them also must I bring. I have other sheep. They're lost, they were divorced. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So the other sheep that Jesus is referred to, when he made this declaration in the scriptures that there's, there were other sheep which are not of my fold, he, of course, was referring to the divorced, put away, dispersed, those of the, of the dispersion, lost sheep of the northern house of Israel. Those are the other sheep. And come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah. Come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus said, They also, these lost sheep, shall hear his voice, and that he was coming to bring all of his Israelite house, family, back into the bonds of the covenant. And also notice that Jesus wants to Keep his sheep together into one fold, one kind, one offspring, or one seed. Amen. Let's read on some more verses real quick. John 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, at the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Now, this is the dedication of the temple, but this is Herod's temple. And they use it, and they call part of it like the porch, Solomon's porch, as we'll see. In the, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, but this was not Solomon's temple. And Herod was an Edomite, might, might I add. And it says, next verse, then came the Jews. Hmm. I want to assure you that a number of them were not true Judeans, but they were Edomite mixed-raced people who had some Judean in them from corruption that had happened in uh, times past that were brought into captivity, and they were there as well. Anyway, then came these Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? Now, there is something going on here. I wish we had time to explore this questioning that's going on here and why they're questioning him. 
He said, they said, if thou, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25, Jesus answered and said unto them, I told you, and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. In other words, what he's really saying is, you unbelieving snakes, remember, folks, there were good figs and bad figs the scriptures tell us about. We could say it this way, there were true Jews and false Jews. Corruptors, and these are corruptors here. But ye believe not. But ye, Notice this, but ye believe not. You heard the truth. But ye believed not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. They weren't the true sheep. They were corruptors. They were deceivers. They were liars. And they'd crept into the temple, as is happening today, perverting the truth of God's word. Jesus said in the next verse, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Hallelujah. And, give, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is deep stuff that's being discussed here, let me assure you. My Father which gave them to me is greater than... Uh, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out, out of my Father's hands. Boy, their sovereignty of God spoken of, declared here. Serious sovereignty of God stuff. He says, I and my Father are one. In verse 31. Might want to underline this. Then the Jews, these Jews, took up stones again to stone him. Do you feel the hate? Oh, yeah. Folks, there's, there, there are so many implications here. It's a spiritual reality that the world, most of the world has no concept of. Judeo-Christianity has no concept of. But again, in closing, notice Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. But there's a problem. And we'll have to get into the problem next time. I'll give you two words. The harling. We've talked about the sheep. Jesus warns us about the harling. And we will close there I know it got kind of deep, I think. But there is spiritual reality that we must do our best to understand. And if we want to put on the whole armor of God, although that isn't the main subject matter of this message. We're through with that series. But we've got to put on the armor of God. And that light will come to bear. Once we do these spiritual things that are required of us, great spiritual light will come to bear upon us. And we'll start seeing things and the blindness will start being removed from his people as we do and put on the whole armor of God. And we pray to our Savior and our Redeemer as our great shepherd, and he will deliver us. That's what the 23rd Psalm is all about. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we love you. We love your purposes. And we commit ourselves to... Uh, you are our king, our great shepherd. We want you to shepherd us, 
because we are your sheep. And we hear jokes all the time about well, how stupid sheep are, but I'll tell you what. Sheep are pretty doggone smart once they come to the place that they understand who they are and who the great shepherd is, and they cling to him, and they love him, and they are there to do his will and his bidding. We want to uh, be obedient to you, Jesus. We want to follow you, and we want to come into your kingdom covenant purposes. Amen and amen. So they stole-